warm up hey, for the president of Portugal. That's pretty cool. Um, so when I was starting wow. to do research for this, I looked up some quick headlines and, and I just Googled your name and it was, the internet is broken at Ev is trying to salvage it. And for his next act, Ev Williams will fix the internet. Um, quite the characterization. So like, where's your cape, first of all? Um, and is this what you're trying to do? Save, save the internet? Save media? Is this, is this it? Uh, I get accused of trying to save the internet a lot. That's not, those aren't my words. I did say it was broken, but I didn't say I personally was going to fix it. I think a lot of people are trying to make it better. It's also great in many ways, uh, but um, I think that what I'm particularly focused on uh, is, is the, the incentive structure around publishing, really, and about idea dissemination, um, creation of high-quality content and stories, how those get um, created, incentivized, and spread to people is what we're trying to focus on in Medium. Well, and so tell me, Medium has gone through many different iterations, right? So we're almost at like Medium 3.0, right? Would that be the... It's mostly the same since day one. So what, is it, what does <laughs> it look like Medium's now? Medium's been around for six years. It's been um, an open publishing platform from day one, meant to be um, a clean, well-lit place to share ideas and stories. And we started focusing on subscription as the business model about a year and a half ago, um, almost two years now. Beginning of 2017 is when we announced our intention to do that. In May of 2017, we fully launched our subscription, and we've been focused on that since then. The core of the product has remained the same. What we've added is a paywall and a subscription, and that's created this new feedback loop where every month, more and more people subscribe. We're spending more and more money on, on content, and uh, that's going very well. You talk about this feedback loop, and Patty mentioned this when he was talking, you know, uh, this attention economy, this idea that screaming, yelling is optimized, is rewarded, and uh, you know, all these things are now happening. So if you could look at it and say, all right, this is what needs to change in order to get us out of this cycle, what do you think it would be? Well, the, I think the fundamental problem that we're focused on is a microcosm of one of the biggest problems in society, which is simply that we've created a world in which attention is rewarded and in quantity, and meaning, meaning it's not the quality of the attention, it's not, um, it's not the, how you make people feel, it's whether you get their attention. And we've optimized these systems, both uh, traditional media, social media, online and offline, where uh, attention is rewarded, and it's what we can measure is rewarded. And we can measure whether people are paying attention by what page their browser is on or what, what social media they're liking. But we can't actually measure how they feel. We can't measure if they're getting smarter. They, we can't measure if they're understanding the world better. And so we've really created this, this system in society where the class clown or the disruptive kid in school who's very effective at getting attention but not effective at helping people, that becomes the winning play. And it's, and it's throughout from, from social media saying, well, how many likes did you get on that statement or how many, how many just eyeballs did you get if you're creating media? And obviously, if you create a system that rewards attention, the easiest way to get attention is to be a bad actor. Not, not, and so that underlies our media ecosystem, that un underlies our political system, and it's, it's degrading society in so many ways. So what do you think, let's look down the road 10, 15 years, what do you think is the, does the media landscape look like if we solve this? Well, if we solve this, I think what I'm excited about right now is we can actually, we're seeing the beginning of a transition away from a pure attention economy for, at least for publishing and, and for other types of media. I mean, if you look at what's happening in television, I think it's, it's encouraging because there's in, you know, 15 years ago, reality t TV seemed to be the epitome after uh, however many decades of TV evolving. It's like, oh, this is what we have now. And, people like it. And obviously, it, it, that still exists and people like it, but that was a result of, of what's the cheapest way that we can get attention. That's what an ad economy will get you. 
And now we live in this other world where that still exists, and there's, there's a whole new art form of deep narrative storytelling that is much richer in production and quality than ever existed before because the business model changed. And so on the internet, we, we're still in the reality TV phase a little bit, uh, but we're starting, there is going to be a premium side that's going to be much better than anything we ever saw before. And I think it's going to be a great time for storytelling, telling, for journalism, for new content forms that actually aren't even sustainable with ads only because the market is being retrained and people are starting to pay. Almost like a model that's similar to Spotify or Netflix. Yeah, I think there will be similar things to that. I mean, subscription works very well. It, it's a good business model. It makes sense to people. People through those, those companies and others have learned that you get a dramatically better experience and, and better content and without the disruption of ads if you're willing to pay. The same thing is going to happen for the things people read and other forms of media. And we're just seeing that working already. But do you think, I mean, Look at Facebook. Wouldn't they have to completely change their business model in order for this to, to be accomplished? Well, I think Facebook and the, the distribution platforms are a different thing than, than what I'm talking about. And because Twitter, Facebook, Google, the, the companies that make the majority of the digital ad money, that is not directly paying for content. That's paying for the distribution of content. And that's paying for social media, which isn't better if people pay for it, really. The best social media is much more personal. It's not motivated by, by commercial gain. And so I'm talking more about the, the publishing in particular, but I think all types of professional media are benefited from a subscription. What if we look to the future and, and great information is what we have to pay for? Do you worry that we almost have the, I, I always like to put on my unintended consequences hat mm -hmm. when looking at the future of tech. Um, do you worry that we're going to have a world where you know, people are able to pay for premium information and then the rest is kind of junk information? This is this junk food epidemic that we just see yeah. playing out in the tech world. I think it's a good question to ask. I don't think that's a concern anytime soon for a couple reasons. One is the most important thing is, first of all, that, that there are systems that enable the creation of, of high quality content. And so um, that's the first thing, that it is even exists. And so many professional journalists have been, you know, jobs have been eliminated over the last few years that um, and quality writing is harder and harder to make pay for. We, we need to make this stuff be rewarded in, in the first place so it exists. But the way most of these systems work today is it actually serves everyone. Because in truth, most paywalls, or meter paywalls, the major consumer paywalls are subsidized models where if you um, can't pay or aren't willing to pay, actually the people who are uh, subsidized, and that's the way Medium works, there's, there's 100 views of every post that's behind the paywall, at least, that are free, uh, because, but, but it's still profitable to publish that, and it's free and ad-free for the majority of people. And there's other systems. I think there's philanthropical funding of journalism and a, a whole lot of other models that I think are going to continue to provide a, a lot of good stuff. What do you think about this trend in Silicon Valley or with the tech CEOs of buying media companies? You have, uh, you know, Amazon, you have Jeff Bezos, uh, Washington Post, recently Benny, uh, Mark Benioff and Salesforce. Um, is this something you guys are doing to save the media? Is this like a, you just want like a, a journal, you want like a media outlet on your trophy mantle? Like what, what is this? Is this the right thing? I don't know if I'm supposed to speak for Mark Benioff and Jeff Bezos, which seems, seems difficult, but I, I haven't bought any media companies, but I think... Have you thought about it? Um, sure. Who doesn't think about buying media companies? Uh, people that don't have um, to I'm in the media. I have a media company and technology company. But I would say two things about that. One is historically, media companies have been family owned. And so it's not a, really a new trend. It just happens to be that these guys are coming from, from tech. And I think their intentions are good. But the second thing that's interesting is, is in many ways up till now, media and tech have been different worlds, just like tech and everything else. And even though media was the first thing to be techified, if you will, or, or move to the internet, it, in, it's sort of been parallel worlds for a long time, and where there's, there's tech-driven media and there's media-driven media. And media-driven media, media is, has lived on the internet and is, uses tech, but it hasn't been, the, we kind of see two different worlds. And so 
I've been thinking about this a lot from the medium point of view. What we've really embraced is saying, you know what, these two things, the best solution for creators and consumers comes when we really infuse one with the other. When we don't limit ourselves to an open platform where everything goes and algorithms determine what people see, but we also don't limit ourselves to a closed world where only a select few have voices and it all has to be uh, created you know, by a select few people. How can we combine these worlds? And I think similarly, I mean, some of the reason that the Washington Post has done well is because it's been infused with tech. And I don't want know what Benioff's plans are for a time, but I do see a better world where where these where basically media, traditional media, embraces tech in a much deeper way, and that will happen whether or not tech billionaires buy them. How do you figure out what's quality content? I mean, there's this whole narrative we're talking about, even at Facebook is struggling with this, what's hate, there, we see very clearly some instances of what's hate speech, what does belong on the platform, what doesn't, but then there's all this in between. And you know, I yeah. think as tech entrepreneurs, everyone's like, oh, we want to go, we don't want to be editors, we don't want to be editorial, but you guys don't exactly have that option anymore. So how do you decide what's quality with the in-between yeah. stuff, not the very clear yeah. abuse and hate speech? One of the interesting lessons in the last year and a half for Medium is that we can't rely on algorithms to determine quality, which is not that surprising, but it was even a little surprising to us because from day one, we prided ourselves on not having superficial metrics like page views or CTR be the determining factor. And we, we wanted the good stuff to rise to the top. So we talked about things like time spent and uh, we have an internal metric we call read through rates, which is not only did you click, but did you uh, pay a certain amount of time. What we found and when we started focusing on what get people to pay is that people, those metrics are still based on consumption rather than quality. And so um, the analogy I usually use is someone puts junk fruit in, in front of you, a lot of people would eat it, personally speaking. You put some tortilla chips right here, they'd be my weakness, but I wouldn't be like, oh, I'm really happy that I consumed that. And so what we found is people will consume things and even spend time on them and not be happy about it. And when you, when you start focusing on getting people to pay, they have to feel good about what they're consuming. If, you, if your model is advertising, they don't have to feel good. They just have to keep doing it. And so the only way we've found to determine that is by using human judgment. And uh, so what we do, we have curation is now a big part of what we do, where we have, we have a pool of content that, that, we, uh, that curators have actually said, this, this is interesting or this is good. And, um, and then we use algorithms on top of that, both, both to filter for the curators and after it's filtered by curators to recommend it to people based on their interests. Um, if you want to lay down for this, you, you can. I want to ask you. Uh, you also created Twitter. Um, so many folks are talking about Twitter ruining democracy, being bad for society. As the creator, as one of the co-creators of Twitter, how do you feel about that? Well, uh, <laughs> um, I'm glad you said co-creator, so I, can, uh, I don't take all the blame for that. But <laughs> you know, I, I think it's overblown somewhat. Uh, I, I don't have the, the illusions of grandeur that I have personally, or even with my co-creators of Twitter's destroyed democracy. Um, and I think we can do better. I think in general, the, the, whether I got asked earlier today, or is society better off with social media? And when you start asking that question, you really have to remember all the, the things we take for granted today that we, d we d wouldn't have without social media. The idea that in, everybody actually has a voice and can put it out there with, with no gatekeepers and important ideas spread that way, and movements spread that way, and Me Too and Black Lives Matter spread that way. And on a smaller scale, people get jobs and, and change their lives and, and make friends, and all these things that we and, um, have seen. We see these examples all the time. So I'm proud to have, been, have been, a, been a part of that creation, 
and I think the, the larger moment we're in where the, like I said, the, the attention is what's getting rewarded in society as a whole is, is, you know, we're certainly part of that as well with Twitter. And the, the other thing I'd say is there is reason to be optimistic as well because I think there's a lot of, we're still in the beginnings really of, of these technologies and how they've impacted society and really understanding them. So think innovation or progress doesn't happen that smoothly. So I'm optimistic there's a lot we can do to make it better. Is there any, looking back, any product decision maybe you would have rethought? Oh, there's many product decisions Anything I would have rethought. Anything specific? Um, I wouldn't, I think showing follow counts uh, or follower counts was um, probably ultimately detrimental. Why? Because it created, it, it really put in your face that the game was popularity. And um, I remember a moment when I was, the, the night before I was going on Oprah to talk about Twitter, I saw on CNN, they were talking about go, go to Twitter and follow CNN, and they were trying to, they're racing Ashton Kutcher to a million followers. No one had a million followers yet. And um, of course, if you have a startup, we are a tiny company. That's like the most amazing publicity at, in, of all time. So it's, it's easy to say in retrospect, well, today maybe we shouldn't have follower accounts. A lot of these things drove growth, and if we wouldn't have had them, um, you know, maybe someone else would have done them and built a much more dominant platform. So uh, uh, there's, but I think today that's not necessarily healthy. A worse one actually that relates to follower accounts is we had this thing we called the suggested user list. Mm. This is my fault where I, when people would sign up for Twitter, they didn't know who to follow. And it wasn't like a Facebook where you just connect to your friends is connect to people you find interesting, but they don't know who's interesting. So we just selected some interesting accounts, and we, we had a group of them that you would, by default, follow if you're just getting started and didn't know who else to follow. So those accounts grew like crazy and got hundreds of, million, or hundreds of thousands of followers very quickly, and then that became success. But those weren't real interest-based follows, and then someone who had grown their following organically compares themselves to them, and it's just, it's inauthentic. And I, so there's, there's things like that that are still built in. Jack's been talking about some of these incentives lately. I think we need to rethink a lot of these things. Um, one of the things that, that you said was interesting that you do at, at Medium is this like, this quickly fail type thing. Um, mm. and, and I'd love if you could tell, because I know there are a lot of entrepreneurs in the audience, um, you said you need the confidence to say you're wrong a lot. So like, yeah. assuming you're wrong a lot, like talk about that and how that plays into building a company, whether it's Twitter or Medium or any yeah. company. You know, it's, I am wrong a lot. And I, one of the things I try to do at Medium and if, uh, try to get better at is being willing to take a stance and be willing to say we're wrong. In fact, I tell my whole company, we always have to remember we're wrong. We're to some degree wrong. We're all wrong in our daily lives about something. And, but before you know what you're wrong about, you assume you're right. And so uh, it's very healthy, I think, to accept the fact that there's some set of stuff we're wrong about at any given time. But what you can't do is let that freeze you in place and say like, well, we're not gonna do this thing because it might be wrong. That paralyzes you. And um, so the, mindset I think you have to take on is say, okay, we're wrong. We need to find out how we're wrong as quickly as possible. So let's run in that direction and look for where we might be wrong about. Look for that hole in the ground. Look for that tree branch that's going to whop you in the head and, and adjust. And today, I, I think that's a natural sort of mindset that you have when you're, when you're doing a startup and you're two people around the table or in the basement. You're like, you're changing your mind seven times a day. Once you've launched something, once you've raised money, once you're on the stage, once you're being critiqued, then I get asked all the time, it's like medium, like you started out, it's like been through all these iterations and there is an assumption that that's a bad thing. Not that you were making that assumption, but I get a lot of, it's like you guys just have tried a lot of things. Like, of course we tried a lot of things. We've, we're trying to do this massive, important project that's going to take a lot of attempts and stuff, and I think we should probably be failing faster than we are. I asked, um, I asked Palmer Lucky this question that I want to ask you. I've asked a lot of entrepreneurs this. What do you think is the single most important uh, ethical question we need to look at when it comes to the future of technology and increasingly this complicated intersection with humanity? 
single most important yeah, if you, episode. Yeah, if you had to jam on, Jeez. like, this is, like, this is dinner table conversation, Silicon Valley, like, take us all here in Lisbon into that, and in, into the conversations you guys have. What are you genuinely thinking about when it comes to, to the future? Uh, I think the thing that is probably the most concerning and affects technology and the economy in general is, is the have and have not question that you asked really. It's really the, 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 the rich getting richer and technology drives that and exacerbates that. And uh, I think that's gonna, the biggest thing I'm worried about sort of as a non-technology issue or I guess maybe it could be is, is climate change and have and have nots is going to be the problem there as well. I don't think humanity is going to go away f from Earth, but I think the people who are will able to survive, I worry, is going to be be who can afford to survive. Uh, so that's a that's a scary question. But it's it the have and have nots will come down to everything. I don't, like I said, I don't concern, not that concerned about information access as much as uh, health access, shelter access. Um, that's a really big deal. Um, I open. Web Summit, I was with Tim Berners-Lee and he was this contract for the web and how we have these great values to, to really have a positive experience and go back to that initial vision that I'm sure you're an optimist, I've mm -hmm. known you for many years, um, going, going back to that. So, because we're closing out, um, you know, Ev Williams, creator of Twitter, blogger, medium, make the case for, for the next version of the internet and social media um, and what it looks like. Argue for this optimistic version of the future. Uh, well, I, I choose to be an optimist. It's hard to, to be in this job or to be in the world without being an optimist. It's more fun. But um, the perspective I always like to add is we're, we're sort of in, I don't think we're in day one of, of technology, as Jeff Bezos likes to say, or the companies, but I think we are in the second inning, if you will. And the... Uh, Media, the internet, all these things have have uh, changed the world in such a short period of time. It shouldn't be expected that we have them correct yet. And I do think a lot of the the problems that we're facing are addressable by technology, just as they've they've been caused by technology. It swings both ways. And um, so when I look at what people are doing, um, the Today, I mean, when an optimistic case, some kids came up to me today who were 16 years old and working on DNA sequencing with nanotechnology and blood testing. And those, the real applications of technology and impacting our lives aren't what media we consume. It's, it's how healthy we are and, um, and much more important things. And we've only scratched the surface of those things. And that's where AI and all kinds of other stuff are really going to serve us. Great. We've got to end. You, you think I'll still have a job, though, right? In the media? And in a decade, I'll you still? you got a good few years. We're not going to okay. replace journalists with robots yet? I can't promise that. OK, great. Uh, OK. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Appreciate it. <laughs>